Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for an up-close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the middle of Los Angeles. Thanks again for joining us. My name is Becca and I work with the education team at La Brea Tar Pits. And as you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and our fossils. I try to get to as many questions as we can and Laura might answer a lot of them during her presentation. But if we don't get to your question today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about this animal on your own. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, um, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw or write a description of what the fossil looks like. And we love fan art of our fossil, so if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they are welcome to email it to the school programs team. And we've got some vocab for you, so if you have your piece of paper, um, feel free to jot them down or grab a screenshot so you can review these words later. So you might hear the word calcanium, which is a heel bone. Extant, meaning it's a species is still living, it's still uh, alive in the world today. Extinct, meaning a species is no longer living um, in the world today. Fossil which is any evidence of ancient life at least 10,000 years or older. Matrix, which is the dirt and sediment surrounding a fossil. Pleistocene, which is also another name for the Ice Age. And Leporid, which is the scientific name of the family of rabbits and hares. So you'll probably hear a couple of those today, um, but we want to give you a chance to write them down quickly or grab a screenshot. All right, so Laura is one of our fossil preparators at the museum, and she has an awesome fossil find that she's going to share with you today. So let's get started. I'm going to switch over to Laura so we can meet today's Ice Age animal, and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hey, Laura, how are things going in Project 23 this morning? Hey there, Rebecca. Pretty good. I promise to bring my face in in a second, but I have a fossil I want to show while I'm standing up close to the tripod, so please let me know if I've got good focus on it. Yeah. Nice Can and pretty. Back a little bit. Absolutely. Oh, Thank you. Oh, wow. I'm pull it around a little bit so you can see it from all sides. So, this one is one of those vocabulary words that we learned just a second ago. This is a calcanium. And uh, this type of fossil will show up again later in my presentation. So, I just wanted to give you a nice close up here. And this one was found uh, in one of the other boxes of Project 23, a um, little bit over that way, over in box nine. I might go work for Sean. But here I'm sitting at the remnants of what was Box 14. So Box 14 started out about, uh, let's see, 85,000 pounds or so. And so again, it was a very large section of Earth. Imagine like you see, you know, other paleontologists that'll take out a plaster jacket that looks kind of like this one, and they'll remove those fossils from a location usually far out in the middle of somewhere and bring it back to the museum to be worked on slowly and carefully. Um, this is the very end of that, and it looks more like that classic thing. Project 23 it started out as 23 very large wooden boxes, same size boxes that you would use to move live trees. So it's like a jacket like this, but like 85,000 pounds just for this one jacket. Um, and so this is that very last little bit. But it got to the point that we started having a lot of issues with wood rot and termite damage, so the box itself was starting to become unstable. So for this last little bit of it, since there were still so many fossils, there's still, I am not exaggerating to say thousands of fossils still in this block right here. Um, this last couple hundred pounds is very tangled up. Uh, so for the safety of the fossils, we just jacked it up this little bit so I can work on it over here in a much more safe and stable environment. Uh, so that's what I have in front of me here. So all these different little bumps are different individual little fossils and some of them likely belong to some of these leopards that we're talking about today, those rabbits and hares. So I think we can go ahead and start my presentation then. And uh, so I used this one rather than an image of the skeleton just by itself, because I really wanted you to get a feel for uh, what it looks like when you have all of those separate individual bones inside that rabbit. And one thing I really did want to point out is that uh, the ears, and there's such a, a beautiful feature that we see don't actually have any bones inside of them. They're made of cartilage and other things, um, but so there's no actual bones inside of them. So 
when you're looking at a skeleton of one, you're like, wait, where are the ears? It's one of the most recognizable things about a rabbit or a hare. They don't have any bones inside of them like that. So a corner are not seeing them here. And we can move right along. And so rabbits and hares, I just want to break it down because they are all in that same uh, family group, scientific group called uh, leopard, uh, <laughs> uh, Leporidae. And so we're breaking it down though into hairs, which are things like uh, this uh, one on the side here, and then rabbits, which make up many different genera and species, whereas most of the hairs are all under the lepus genera, but we don't need to focus on that one. Um, but I do want to mention that while the scientific names are standard, whether I'm talking about it or a researcher in England or someone in China, we're all using the same scientific names so that we make sure that we're all talking about the same animal. But common names or the names that you think of when you think of an animal usually, those ones can vary from region to region and are sometimes a little confusing. And so, for example, uh, this hair that I have here as an example, its common name is a jack rabbit, but it's not a rabbit, it's a hare. And then there are some uh, rabbits that are called hares, even though they're rabbits. And, uh, and I did want to acknowledge that I am in the middle of a busy city, so I apologize for the noise in the background, but that's what we get when we're here authentically with the fossils. And uh, so again, some rabbits are called hares, some hares are called rabbits, but I'm going to try to be as clear as possible in here, but just so you know for the future. Uh, some of the main differences between rabbits and hares is that hares tend to be much larger. And some of the easiest things to look at, though, is not just the overall size, but the length of the back legs and the length of the ears are some of the features they're going to look at to really kind of try to quickly make that uh, delineation. Uh, hares babies, when they're born, um, within about an hour or so, they're ready to hop around, they're good to go. Whereas rabbit babies are born uh, hairless and with their eyes closed and pretty helpless for several weeks. Um, so if you're seeing a, a fresh baby, that's another way that'd be easy to tell the difference. But again, it's harder to tell once it's an older rabbit versus a brand new baby hair. Um, their fur is quite different in that even though both of them will uh, molt their fur and kind of switch out their coats during the spring and the fall, usually just to you know be a little bit thicker during the winter, just like you would wear more layers. Um, they kind of do that naturally with their fur and hairs especially um, tend to change their color a lot more dramatically, especially hairs that live in areas with snow tend to go to a more full white coat during the winter and then back to a brown coat during the summer. And that's mostly so they uh, blend it with their environment easier. So especially if they're on snow, you want to be bright brown running across snow, it's going to be much easier to see you. Um, and so along those same lines, hares tend to live in more open environments, prairies and tundra and that sort of thing. Whereas rabbits tend to like living in more enclosed areas, better places for them to hide. And uh, part of that is related to their speed. Uh, hair strategy, when they're uh, running into danger, we'll kind of combine these two, is to just run away from it. And they can get up to about 40 miles an hour. So pretty fast. That's about 55-ish uh, kilometers per hour. And then rabbits are only about 30 miles an hour, about 35 kilometers an hour. Uh, so they're a bit slower, but again, whereas the hares, as their defense, they will try to run away, rabbits tend to go more for the hiding strategy. And uh, friends, whereas hares tend to be more loners, they tend to not really socialize with others other than uh, when they're ready to make babies, uh, then they will get together. And they do tend to be uh, much more visually displaying at that time, which is also where you get the phrase, not as a March hare, because they're all focused on trying to decide to make babies and that's when they look really crazy. Whereas rabbits uh, tend to live in social groups and uh, will sometimes live underground as well in group warrens, but sometimes up to 20 individuals. And hares tend to like a little bit tougher food, more like barks and twigs and that sort of thing. Whereas rabbits tend to like more grasses and softer foods, but a lot of them will change what they eat just depending on what the environment is like at that particular space and time of year. And uh, whereas hares do not, as a rule, make good pets, um, they just have, don't have a good temperament for it. Again, in the, in the wild, they're not very social. So, you know, while sometimes someone can socialize one a little bit, they do not make very good pets. Whereas rabbits have been domesticated into pets. But I do want to mention that if you do have a pet rabbit and rabbits in your neighborhood outside, you want to make very careful to keep them separate 
even like make sure to wash your hands if you've been outside before you pet your pet rabbit, because there are diseases that wild rabbits can carry that they have a lot more protections naturally against that can be very, very dangerous to pet rabbits. So I just want to make sure to mention that to keep your pet rabbits safe and keep them separate from wild rabbits. Thank you. And uh, not to be confused and also just, you know, we live right next to the ocean. So I like throwing out this one is a sea slug nicknamed a sea hare because it has those little rhinophores up on top that uh, the person who was giving it that common name said, oh, they kind of look like the, the ears of a hare, even though technically they're kind of closer to our nose because they're taking chemicals out of the water. But I just put this in to be funny because I like it. And I might as well share another animal, but we can move on. And so this one is, again, starting with hares. Uh, this one's a skull of a black-footed jackrabbit, which is a hare. And it is the most common type of hair that we find here at the Tarpets. And um, this particular one isn't from Project 23. This is from one of the earlier excavation pits, but I had such a beautiful picture of it that I wanted to use it. So this is that uh, black, uh, black-tailed jackrabbit. Uh, so this is the one that we saw the picture of earlier. And uh, if we want to see kind of more what it looks like with all of its flesh and fur on it, I went ahead and included a picture of that as well. And uh, so here again, you can see with those long ears and those long legs that it's showing off while it's grooming. But what I really wanted to do today, again, with these rabbits and hares is remind you that even though we're seeing these fossils that are tens of thousands of years old that we're recovering from this site, these animals are still extant. They're still around. They're great, 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 lots of great grandkids are likely still represented in some of the populations in our area. So whereas a lot of times when we're talking about fossil animals, it's easy to think only about the extinct animals, like the saber-toothed cats or the cracker merricks or the sloths. But I just want to remind everybody that many of the animals that we have, especially the smaller animals, are still around today. And many of them are still in the Los Angeles area. You can go up in some of the mountains around this area and still go find these hares. And uh, next I have a photo of one of the uh, rabbit, this is a lower jaw of one of those uh, desert cottontails, which is a rabbit. Uh, this is the most common type of rabbit that we have out of Project 23 so far. Um, this one is the lower jaw. It's missing a little bit at the very back of the jaw, but otherwise you can still see some of the cheek teeth up there on the side. And uh, this particular rabbit uh, is so common out of Project 23 that when we had a recent researcher look at it, uh, Dr. Nate Fox, and he took samples of all of our rabbits and hares from Project 23. And of the 59 samples that he was able to take and identify specifically down to species, 52 of those 59 were this particular rabbit. So it is the most common leopard of Project 23. But again, what does it look like still with its fur and flesh on? It looks like this. And I love this picture especially. So if any of you ever get the chance to come visit the Tor Pits Park, uh, one of the areas that we have uh, basically between the museum and the excavation site project 23 where I'm at is an area that we call the Pleistocene Garden, which Pleistocene was that word we used earlier uh, to talk about the specific geological time period that we're in right now. And what we did for that area is that we took um, types of plants that we found fossils of, that the plants were still extant or still had those plants around in the environment. And we went out into those environment, found those same potential great, great, great grandchildren of those plants and brought them back into one space. So you can see some of the plants that were here before we built the city in the way and had all of the changes that we've had happen. And I just love it that so some of these same plants that had been here, along with some of those same rabbits that had been there. So this picture was taken about 21 months ago, but it's just as easily have been taken, you know, 21,000 years ago. Thank you. And so while this is the most common of the rabbits that we have, the second most common rabbit that we have at least out of Project 23 is this one here, this brush rabbit. Um, it's also a type of cottontail, but whereas the desert cottontail that I was talking about is one of those where it kind of breaks the mold of rabbits a little bit and kind of acts more like a hare in many ways. Um, it doesn't live in social groups, but it doesn't mind like eating in social groups. Like it'll go out and hang outside and like eat with other rabbits and it doesn't really mind. Whereas a hare would be like, this is my place, get out of here. Um, but uh, this brush rabbit of it uh, is another one of those that um, is in that cottontail rabbit where they kind of are a much more social than the hares would be. Um, and so these ones are the ones that about seven of those 59 
individuals that were sampled out of Project 23 were this particular one. And all seven of those, as it happens from that particular sample set, were from box 14, this particular block. So uh, the rabbits that I find in here are going to be most likely both uh, that cottontail, that desert cottontail, and this brush rabbit, just more commonly the cottontail than the brush rabbit. And uh, so here's that illustration that I had again. And I wanted to highlight uh, the calcaneum, that heel bone that we were talking about, and uh, put a little arrow on there so you can see again where that is. So that's the back of the foot. But again, because their legs are stretched out a little bit longer than ours are, uh, especially a hare's foot is much more about this long. But again, it's that back bit. So when that uh, hare was grooming earlier, it was playing about its ankle, even though it looked a little bit more like its elbow or its knee because of its back leg. But so here's where that calcaneum is. And then on my next slide, um, I have more of those, just like I had that clean one from box nine. These ones are some of those calcanium or calcanei for plural. Um, and so each of those is calcanium uh, from box 14. And so again, those are most likely the cocktail or the desert cocktail. And then some of them could potentially be the brush rabbit. I have to wait until the laboratory uh, inside the museum cleans them up to know for sure. Um, but again, I really like them because they're one of the most uh, common fossils that we find. Uh, again, we think about, you know, a dire wolf is our most common large animal, but once we really get down to it, so all of these calcania, so the, the multiple calcania, were all found in the same day. So again, just a reminder that we have lots of dire wolves, but once we get into the small animals, we have lots of rabbits as well. And we also have a hare that I'm holding right at the bottom of my picture. And uh, so again, these are very diagnostic. It's easy for my volunteers to kind of like see that shape and learn what it is. And uh, that shape uh, is, has been very consistent. It is actually considered the, the leopard ankle. It's very diagnostic when you're trying to look at uh, rabbits and hares and their fossil ancestors in other places, which I have on my uh, little addition right here. So again, uh, these are about uh, 43,000 years ago. And over here to the side, I have some that are about 53 million years ago. So again, these were closer to living with the dinosaurs than they are close to living with us. And yet, those ankle bones are still looking very much like they are uh, tens of thousands of years later. This one's just a slightly larger in the pictures, but uh, they're all about the same size individual. It hasn't changed a long time tens of millions of years, that shape has worked really well for getting those rabbits and hares where they need to go. And uh, that is the end of my presentation, because I know and hope uh, that many of you have some additional questions that you'd like to ask. So let's hop to it. That's awesome, Laura. Thanks so much. I love all your little jokes in there as well. And those little, all of these little bunnies are so cute looking. I, rabbits and hares, excuse me, I should, I should use their correct names now that I know them. So we have a ton of great questions here for you, Laura. Zubaida is wondering, what is the coolest thing or fact about fossils for you? Oh man, that is really hard. Basically every time you ask me that, I'll probably have a different answer. Um, but for me, I think one of the biggest things, uh, especially as I was growing up, because you know, when I was growing up, most of the fossils that I heard about were things like dinosaurs and other extinct animals. And I think that it wasn't really until I was working here that I just see just the volume. So of the about 650 different animals and plants that we have here, only about 9% of those are extinct. So almost all of the animals and plants that we had here for tens of thousands of years are still in the Los Angeles area just not necessarily here anymore because we built the city in the way the weather's a bit different but it's it's important to think of just how different it is if even if you lose just that nine percent of those different animals and how different things can be but also i just love the fact that i can you know find one of those rabbits and then as i'm leaving at the end of the day it starts getting a little bit dark i can see some of them like scurry around in the bushes in the Piscine garden i'm like oh look i've been finding your great 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 grandparent so for me i like that fossils don't necessarily always have to be extinct. The yeah. shorter. Awesome. That's amazing. I, I think this is a really great example to, to highlight that um, because, yeah, we see those rabbits and hares hopping all over the place in that park all the time. And it's, it is very cool to think that maybe it's their great, 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 great 
great grandparent of some sort. Very cool. I think it was a good time of year for it as well with, you know, some people celebrating Easter coming up. There's a lot of rabbit decorations in all the stores around my neighborhood at least. So absolutely I have rabbits on the brain. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so Isaac is wondering if you find fossils every day. So do I find them every day? No. Well, one, because I have weekends and that sort of thing. But I assume you mean when I'm here on site getting to work on these. Um, and that still depends on exactly where I'm working, where I'm digging. On Block 14, yes, I'm finding many, many fossils every day, dozens of fossils every day. But in some of the other areas where I'm just uh, slowly, carefully getting through some of the sterile matrix, so matrix that doesn't have fossils in it, but we still need to go through it carefully, both to understand the geology and just in case there are fossils in it that we just aren't noticing. Um, in some of those areas, you know, it might be all day long and I don't see a fossil the whole day, but it's still exciting because every single grain of sand I move, I'm still the first person ever to see behind that grain of sand. So I'm still digging for buried treasure, even if I'm not finding fossils that particular day. That's awesome. Very cool to think you're the first person in thousands of years to see something. I can't even imagine that sometimes. Um, Caitlin and Chloe are wondering, how do you find the species of a fossil? How do you identify what species um, it's coming from? And how do you identify between a hare or a rabbit when you do find a fossil? Absolutely. Um, and so for a lot of those, for me, uh, rabbit and hare, the easiest way that I'll do it uh, for my field identification is just by size. Because it'll be the same type of shape, but just much larger, especially on those back legs. Um, but if I'm ever not sure, I can just write, you know, leopard and just kind of give it the whole umbrella. And then once it gets clean inside the museum, uh, we have specialists in the air. And then also sometimes we'll get specialists from other places, like Dr. Fox that I was talking about earlier, where he came in and in that particular paper, he was looking at the P3, so the premolar three, and all the different little shapes on the tooth when you're looking at it very, very, very close and using that to be able to tell the difference between these different rabbits. Um, so a lot of that is a little more specialized for me. I can, I can tell you it's a rabbit. I can even tell you that it's likely a Sibilogus rabbit, um, so that specific genus. But when it gets down to species, I let a specialist do that. But that's okay. I don't have to know everything when everything is still covered in matrix. Um, the most important thing for me on that field ID is just to get it close enough and accurate enough so in the future when we know that someone's going to want to be looking at those types of things, the laboratory can prioritize some of those particular fossils. Awesome. So there's still a lot of teamwork that's going on in your work. Cool. Thanks again. Um, so Julianne is wondering if there is a fossil that's a species you haven't discovered yet. Uh, very likely. Um, I will say that I think that the species that we don't know we have here yet that we come across have been in the recent past and are likely to be in the future of the smaller animals and plants. Um, the most recent uh, fossil that we didn't know that we had that species here already was actually a freshwater limpet that was stuck to a sloth skull uh, a couple years ago. And the limpet's about this big. I'm just dramatically holding my fingers together. It's quite small. Uh, but it's one of those freshwater shelled creatures that kind of looks like a little, like, a drawing of a volcano almost. Um, and so that particular type of limpet was known to science, but we didn't know that we had it here in our freshwater streams that had been here before the city. Uh, so that was one of the newest species that we know about. But I predict that uh, we're more likely to find some unusual small things that we didn't know that we had. Uh, I think it's likely that most of the big things we've seen over and over after the millions of fossils in our collection. But I, I feel very comfortable betting that we're going to find more small things than we didn't know that we had here. Again, with some of those little nuances where the field identification was a little bit more broad, but it'll take a specialist to come in and be like, oh, actually, this particular plant is a different one than the plant that you thought it was. They're just cousins. Mm. Oh, that's exciting to think about. I, I look forward to seeing what we find in those little fossils. Uh, Leslie's wondering if you can tell the age of the rabbit or hare based on the fossil that you find. Um, and so the geologic age is something that they'll test uh, by looking at carbon-14 and uh, taking samples of the bone and uh, looking at it at a laboratory, but the age of this particular individual is, I think, the, the question. Um, so I can usually tell if it's from a young or like a, like a baby individual versus an adult, 
because uh, rabbits and hares are mammals, just like you and I. And the way we do that, that, uh, that trick where we start out much smaller and get much larger is that on a lot of our bones, there are growth pieces on the ends called epiphyses that are separate pieces that are closer to adult size than shapes so that you can still do all of the things with your limbs that you need to do when you're a child. But then they're separate from that central piece, that diaphysis, that that's the main piece that you'll grow from and give you space to get taller and longer. And then when you're finished growing, those epiphyses will attach and fuse and turn into one solid bone instead of multiple pieces. And so sometimes I can look at those rabbit fossils and see, oh, you know, this calcaneum is missing its distal epiphysis it's from a young rabbit versus an adult rabbit. Okay, so it'll it'll look a little bit different if it is older than younger. So it kind of depends a little bit sometimes if you can see those little parts. Am I getting that right? So yeah, if it's a baby, I should be able to tell. But if it's an adult, it's harder for me to tell if it's a young adult versus an old adult. Okay, cool. Well, you mentioned the calcaneum and Caitlin is wondering how long is the biggest calcaneum of a rabbit or a hare? Um... Let's see, so I think that the ones, so again, I only know the species that we have here, um, but this one is, oh, about an inch or so. Um, and this one's about average, this is an adult. I can tell because of that, the physicist on the end is there and fully attached, I don't see a line of it. Um, so this one's from an adult, and so this calcane's about an inch, whereas a hair would be closer to about an inch and a half or so. Okay, cool. Um, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. So if we don't get to your question today, I'm sorry, and I hope you write it down and, and look it up on your own. Um, but Hillary's wondering, why do we normally only find the bones and not the skin or hair of some of these extinct animals? Absolutely. Uh, so the way that we find our fossils is by uh, preservation in asphaltic matrix. So it's that silts and sands and clay that or crude oil from the fields underground have come up and seeped into. That's also why the sediment that I'm digging in is very black in color, and why the fossils that I'm holding are very brown in color. They've gotten into all the tiny little spaces of the bone, and that oil on the inside of the bone is what protects those hard tissues like bones and teeth, and protects them for tens of thousands of years, whereas the softer things like the fur and uh, the flesh and that sort of thing would likely have potentially rotted uh, when the animal first died and not necessarily been preserved as much, but also then uh, it wouldn't be preserved by the asphalt because it doesn't have the same structure for that asphalt to go in and protect it. Whereas the, the chemistry of what bones and teeth are made out of is a lot different. Cool, all right, thank you. Um, so we actually have, I have two questions I'm gonna ask in one time because I think they're both pretty interesting. So Saif is wondering, how does it feel when you go out to find a fossil? And Jaden is wondering if the fossils are stinky. Um, so I'll do the, 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 the smell first. I will say that Project 23 especially, the fossils are very, very rarely stinky because that fresh oil that's coming up is where a lot of those um, more volatile elements that are here, those hydrogen sulfides and that sort of thing. Um, and because this oil isn't coming up fresh, because it's been picked up and moved over to this part of the park, that fresh oil isn't coming up, so it's not as stinky. Every once in a while, we come across an area that, in general, mostly just smells like dirt, um, silts and sands, that sort of thing. Um, it's more the, the fresh asphalt seeps around that give that beautiful aroma to the area. Um, and what does it feel like? I mean, I'm spoiled rotten. I get to come out and play with, in the dirt and dig up all dead things and get people excited about science and hang out with cool people someday. I'm hanging out with you right now, Becca. Yeah. And all of you on camera with me as well. Um, but so for me, I, I think I'm ridiculously spoiled. I love what I do. Um, because again, like just the opportunity to be the first person to find new things and selfishly fun, but then getting to share that with other people is a less selfish one. Yeah, awesome. I think what you do is amazing and I can help with Jaden's question and, and walking into the front of the museum as soon as you walk into the park, you can usually smell that asphalt. So it's it's quite fragrant. So it's interesting that the fossils themselves, when you're getting down in there, they don't quite smell quite as asphalty as, as the rest of the park does. So awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for answering all of these questions. If we didn't get to your question today, 
write it down, look it up on your own. Um, if you find a cool answer, let us know. And you want to say again, thank you for joining us. We learned so much about rabbits and hares and I love to know that they were here in the ice age in Los Angeles and they're still, I can find them in my backyard or when I go to Hancock Park, I can see them over by the tar pits too. Um, so if you wanna learn more from our fossil preparators, you can give them a follow on Instagram at the La Brea Tar Pits. And you can also um, find all of the videos from these presentations or others on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. So you can catch this recording and a lot of others at youtube.com slash the La Brea Tar Pits. Thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you next month for our uh, another edition of Inside the Fossil Lab. And then we'll also have another fossil finds as well. So hope to see you all there. Have a great rest of your day and thanks again for joining us.